Minasan, konnichiwa, and welcome to the Board Game Dojo podcast, where this week, while we are researching for the next episode, we are going to cover Oink Games, the big Japanese publisher with tiny box sizes. Between successful Kickstarters, continuously growing presence at the Tokyo game market, and now some of their games being developed for the Nintendo Switch, they've been growing in international presence, so we thought it would be fun to go over our picks of ones to buy, ones to avoid, and what we think about them in general. So let's just delve right in and start with the big three that Oink is probably most known for. The first one is Insider, and the follow-up, Insider Black. Insider is a hidden role spin on the game 20 Questions. Most people are normal players trying to figure out the word, but one person is the insider who actually already knows the word. If everyone can guess the correct word when the timer runs out, they're super close to winning. The players have to decide who the insider was, and if they get it right, they win. But if they get it wrong, the insider wins. What this means is that there's a suspicion that hangs over every question someone asks because the insider wants to gently guide the players to the correct answer, but not too obviously as to give themselves away. And if players tie on voting who the insider is, the person who ended up shouting the correct word gets to be the tiebreaker, meaning it's in the best interest of the insider to scream out the word, but not too early, because then it's, again, too obvious. Insider Black adds difficulty in banned questions like appearance questions, a team game, or my personal favorite, the follower role. The follower doesn't know the word, but they do know who the insider is, and their job is to stealthily help further the insider's line of questioning to better hide them. This game is a classic oink game for a reason, and I kind of feel bad starting the show with it because it's earned its place on Mount Oink Olympus. It's such a simple rule set that it means I can play this with anyone, especially because most people are familiar with the game at the heart of it, 20 questions. I think that after a few times, Insider Black is a great difficulty upgrade, and we highly recommend both for any board game collection. It is worth mentioning, however, that a similar game exists. Werewords. In fact, there was quite the controversy when Werewords came out because Oink accused them of copying this game, and they are very, very similar games. I'm not here to say one way or the other on that case. The founder of Bezier Games, who published Werewords, said he was designing it for years and that Oink happened to publish first, and things like that really do happen in board game design a lot. The reason I bring this up now is that one really doesn't need to own both of them, and Werewords is often cheaper. So it's worth looking into both to see which one is right for you. Werewords has more roles, and so is more complicated but still not super difficult, while Insider is much simpler. I have both, and I've played Insider more often because I'm usually playing with people new to gaming when I want to play a party game like this, but both are great options. This won't be the only time I mention that an Oink game is too similar to another game to justify owning both, but that's for much later. The second of the big three, which aren't in any particular order, mind you, is A Fake Artist Goes to New York. This is a drawing game and works much the opposite of Insider. Everyone will draw a picture together and everyone knows what word they are trying to draw, except one person, the fake artist. It works like this. Everyone has a tiny whiteboard thing in front of them that the game master for the round will collect and announce a category, say animal. On everyone but one's whiteboard, they'll write the same word, like cat, but on one board they write X. Then they give everyone their boards back and one at a time, people add one line to the drawing, trying to prove that they definitely aren't the fake. Everyone will go around twice, then they have to figure out who the fake artist is. Should be easy, right? You just need to draw well and make it obvious. Add whiskers to the cat or something. But that's where you are wrong. Because if the fake artist is chosen correctly, they will get a chance to guess what the drawing is supposed to be. And if they are right, they win. So it's a game of balance, trying to add just enough to hint to the other players that you are a real artist. You went to NYU art school and are totally on board with whatever is happening. But at the same time, you can't make it too obvious or else the fake artist will easily be able to either not be found out or know what the drawing is. It's probably the oink game that has caused the most amount of laughter out of all of them. It helps that many of my friends can't draw anyways, but that's almost a skill, not a curse in this game. And it's so funny to watch drawings take shape, sometimes for the, yeah, that's kind of understandable in an abstract way kind of direction, but sometimes in the what on earth are you doing kind of way. We've had sushi that has turned into a hamburger because the fake artist was so sure it was a burger that they drew a bun. We've had art that even Salvador Dali would think is too weird. 
but every time we have a lot of fun and we can't recommend this game enough. If we were to going to choose one game on this list that everyone should buy, it would probably be this one. The third of the big three is Deep Sea Adventure, and it, uh, well, we didn't like it at all. But let me describe it first. Deep Sea Adventure is a push-your-luck game, or in Japanese, a chicken race game. We are divers going down, down, down for better and better treasure. Along the way, you can pick up loot for points, which you need to bring back to the ship. However, we are all sharing the same oxygen tank, and the more loot you are carrying, the more oxygen you are losing, and the harder it is to move and get back to the ship. If you ever start your turn with the oxygen at zero, you drown and lose everything. This game, like other Oink games, has a really small form factor, and the rules are easy enough. It looks inviting on the table because the color scheme is really nice, and it doesn't take much time to play. And I'm pretty happy about that, because I never enjoy my time playing this game. For one, every game feels pretty much the same, but that's only slightly the problem. You see, with your Press Your Luck games, I really enjoy having your own hubris be the reason you lose. I like the constant tension of pushing further but maybe losing everything or turning back and risking that you didn't pick up enough to win. Games like Ink and Gold do this phenomenally, and this important thing is that it's all my fault. But in Deep Sea Adventure, your luck is determined by other players. Did everyone continue to press on? Well, you'll all run out of oxygen, die, and nobody wins. The game is played in three rounds, and sometimes this will happen all three times. Or it'll happen the first two times, then someone will take one loot, turn around, and then win with one point. This game, more than anything, feels like you are just reacting to other people, but in a not fun way. It probably also doesn't help that nowadays there are just so many good press your luck games, like the aforementioned Ink and Gold, or Quacks of Quedlinburg, Clank, or Cubitos. Sure, this game is the tiniest, and to some it'll be the most attractive, but it also has the least amount of player agency, the most repetitive game loop, and the least ability to get better at the game. I know that there are many, many fans of this game. This game is arguably the game that put Oink on the map, but I am just not one of them. I can appreciate it for what it was when it came out, but you can do a lot better now. Okay, let's get back to some positivity and let's go on to two games that are probably the best non-party-like oink games. The first one is Startups, a game all about investing into companies. You'll draw and play cards to try to accrue the most of companies. On each turn, you'll draw a card and play a card. There will be cards out in the open to pick from, the discards let's call them. Or you can draw a card from the deck, but you must pay a coin on each discarded card. If you pick one of the discarded cards, you can take any coins on those, and you can take those for free. However, there's a catch. You will be playing cards in front of you, and for each company that you have the most of on the table, you get the anti-monopoly chip. And while you have it, you cannot choose any discarded card of the same company, meaning that while you're the majority shareholder, you can't keep getting more shares. What's so great about this is the constant tension that happens throughout the game. The anti-monopoly chip starts scattering around the table and constantly switching hands. It becomes a hindrance to be the majority shareholder. And what's more, at the end of the game, the cards that remain in your hand are added to your collection, meaning that you may think that you want a company, but in fact, someone comes in at the end with a surprise takeover. And at the end of the game, once those cards are shown, the players who invested anything into a company and isn't the majority shareholder in that company then has to pay the majority owner for each share they bought. It's wicked, but it's oh so fun when you cleverly come in and take over a company and someone who thought they won it has to pay you a lot of money at the end of the game. I have a lot of card games that make people laugh, and I have a lot of card games that make people think, but it's so rare to find one that does a little of both. There's room for clever play, but there's also plenty of chance in the deck as well, as every game there are some cards removed. It's just the right balance between the two that there's room for mental investment into the game, but not so much that it becomes a weight on the mind. This is on our list of best fillers in general, and is definitely one of the crowning jewels in the Oink Games crown. The second non-party game to highlight is Mask Men, a wrestling-themed trick-taking game from Jun Sasaki and trick-taking master Taiki Shinzawa. It's a bit hard to wrap your head around it and is one of those games in which I always explain that the first game really is a practice game. At the start of the game, you don't even know the ranking of the suits. Throughout the round, the players will decide it. In a round, players will, can play cards or pass on their turn. 
Players play one to three cards on their turn of the same type of wrestler that hasn't already been played to help resolve the strength of the wrestler. If, for example, you play one orange card, the orange wrestler is pretty weak. And if the next person plays two purple cards, well, two is more than one, so the purple color now ranks above orange. And this keeps going, with people trying to get rid of all the cards in their hand while the rankings be decided. The faster you get rid of your cards, the faster your chances of winning. As soon as you empty your hand, you get to take the highest point token available, then the next player to go out gets the next token. Once there is only one player remaining, the round ends and that player gets the negative one point token. It's honestly much more straightforward than what I'm describing on a podcast, and if I've piqued your interest, I would recommend going and watching Taylor's Trick Taking Tables review on it, which I'll link in the show notes below, after you're done listening to this episode, of course. For a trick taker, this game looks great. Often trick takers are more about functionality, but the components here are functional and look great. It's not very often that people look at a table of someone playing a trick taker and go, whoa, what is that? But the game is also really quite fun. It invokes the theme really well, and I feel competitive during it. It's fun to watch your strongest suit come out on top as you have four purples in your hand and someone else plays a bunch of purples so the purple fighter is the strongest in the round, which means you're one of the strongest in the round with all those purples in your hand. Play is quick and this is definitely one of those trick takers that you can feel yourself getting better and better at the more you play, especially when you play with the same group of people. If you're into trick taking, you owe it to yourself to take a look at Mask Men. Point Games has experimented with metal coins in multiple of their games, and we will be covering two of them today. One of them good, and one of them not so good. Let's start with the harsh review first. Moneybags is, for my money, the worst Oink game in the catalog. It, alongside a game we will talk about a bit later, commits one of the greatest sins in my book, having quite a bit of theoretical promise, but not actually working in practicality. In Moneybags, you each have a pouch with metal coins in it, but you can never look in the bag. You have to hold your bag by the side of it and you can try to judge how many coins you are based on sound or weight. On your turn, you can steal coins from another person, close your bag to say, hey, I'm done for the round, and nobody can steal from you or give you anything, or you can just pass without closing your bag, meaning you can still be stolen from. The crux of the game is in the challenges, when if someone thinks you stole from them and they now have less treasure than you, then you both dump your coins out and count them. If they're right, you have to give all your money to them and you're out for the round. If they're wrong, they give money to you and they're out. There's also a diamond that is super light that's worth 10 points at the end of the round. For something that sounds like a bluffing game that might be funny and ends up being, for lack of a better word, dull. The coins are cool, but the bags are too small, the diamond placement is random and pretty much impossible to figure out where it is, and the game is like talking to that relative on the phone who just won't stop talking. It quite overstays its welcome and you're just sitting there wondering when it'll be over. And yes, it's a bit cathartic to talk about it, but that's not really the point in me talking about it here. The point is that this game illustrates a recent trend in Oink games. Let me take a step back. We are newbies to the podcast and YouTube scene, so we try to follow trends in Japanese and Asian board gaming. And Oink has this aura in which people from around the globe takes pride in owning every single game they publish. I don't know if it's the fact that the box size is small or that the art style speaks to them. I don't know. And if people who do that are happy, then I'm happy for them. All the power to them, I'm happy they can enjoy the hobby in their own way. But I don't really recommend doing that for most people, especially because of games like Moneybags. Lately, Oink Game feels a bit more experimental than good. I'm all for experimenting, but it actually has to work. Moneybags doesn't work. They also had a game called Void, which they showed at an exhibition titled Is This a Game, in which people make a game scene using game pieces that are whiteboards, post it online, then the person who gets the most likes wins. It's experimental. And I think that's where Oink Games is heading. Their latest game is just a publishing of a game Japanese kids play on the playground for free, Kankari, which is like hide and seek mixed with kick the can. The point I'm long-windedly trying to get at is, I don't think Oink remains as a game publisher in which you need to collect all of their games. Their hit rates of games I'd say are good is somewhere in the 25% range. Whether buying their games knowing it's an experiment is something you're interested in is up to you. I want you to be aware that, nowadays, the hit rate has decreased for this lovable Japanese publisher. There is another game that uses metal coins, and this time well, and that's Kobayakawa. We went over it in our 5 Japanese Hidden Gems episode a few weeks ago, but it's worth mentioning here again. 
Kobayakawa is a bluffing micro game produced by Oink in Japan and Yellow Abroad. I can tell you all of the rules in about 30 seconds. At the start, each player is given 4 tokens and 8 tokens are placed in the middle of the table. Each player is dealt one card face down and an additional card is dealt face up next to the deck. This card is called the Kobayakawa. Each player takes a turn and either draws a card to their hand and discards one card face up in front of them, or turns over the top card of the deck to replace the current Kobayakawa. After all players have taken their turns, each must decide if they want to stay in and fight by betting a token. All players that decided to fight reveal their card. The player that has the lowest value card gets to add the value of the current Kobayakawa card to their own card. The player with the highest number, their own card or their own card plus the Kobayakawa, wins the round and they take all the tokens that players bet, plus a bonus token from the middle. Then they take the start player token for the next round. On the seventh round, when only two tokens remain in the middle, the stakes and the bonus are doubled to two tokens. After the seventh round, the game ends and the player with the most tokens wins the game. Kobayakawa came during the peak of the micro game, and I think it's one of the better ones. It's amazing what this little game can do. The rules are simple enough for anyone to grasp, and the bluffing is just enough to allow people who want to lie and bluff to have fun doing it, but not so much that those who feel uncomfortable bluffing cannot have fun. You can win by bluffing, but you can also win by not. It's a great game that, even though it says 15 minutes on the box, you might end up playing for an hour because you are having that much fun. I'm not sure if you remember, but I mentioned that there would be another game in which I would say, this is good, but if you have this other game, you probably don't need both. Well, we don't talk about Bruno, but we do talk a lot about a game called Durian. Durian is a game in which orders will be coming in, and you need to make sure that the cards that everyone has shows enough ingredients to fulfill those orders. The trick is that you can't actually see your own card. You can only see everyone else's. So as players play one card at a time from the order deck and decide which side of the card they think they can satisfy, you all are looking at their card going, hmm, do we have enough? If you don't think so, you can ring the bell to call over a manager. That's when everyone shows their cards. If the person is correct with their challenge, the player who played the glass card takes the angry gorilla card worth points. If the challenger is wrong, they take the angry gorilla card. The game is over if someone reaches seven points and they lose and everyone else wins. This game is one of many that now have the mechanic where you can see everyone else's cards but not your own. Hanabi was a big one almost 10 years ago and recently Letter Jam integrated it with a word game. But to me, Durian has more the feel of a party game called Coyote. In Coyote, you also cannot see your card, but you can see everyone else's, and there's a hidden card in the middle. However, in this game, all the cards are numbers, some of which might be negative, and people yell out challenges of the total they think the numbers combine to make. You keep re-raising this total until someone issues a challenge in which everyone flips their cards and tallies the totals. Now there are some special cards that make the highest number zero or change the values in other ways, but that's pretty much the gist of it. If you lose the challenge, you lose a life, and it's a last person standing kind of game. The two feel really similar, not just in the whole can't see your card thing, but just the atmosphere of the game itself. The imperfect information, the tension as you have to decide what the probability is that you haven't busted yet, and the fact that both games have special cards that throw that probability out of the window. I have both, but I don't really think you need both. Coyote is much more of a game of straight bluffing and deception. You might be looking at someone who has a negative 10 card, but right away bet 20, so that they think they have a high card. You are not only hoping to survive, you are hoping to eliminate everyone else. And this makes the game feel more competitive. It's also just straight more mathy. Durian is much more relaxed and humorous. Coyote is also funny, but Durian's art style and premise and the little bell that comes in the box just make it feel more breezy. And the fact that everyone but one person wins instead of the opposite lends itself to that. I know some people really don't like games that do that, like Cockroach Poker, because it feels bad to be the only one who loses. But ultimately, I think Durian feels light enough, almost that it was out of your control, that it doesn't upset people too much. It's definitely a game I would look at if you're looking for a game that's kinda silly and a great game to play with the family. The final original game we will cover in depth is on a bit of a negative note, one we cannot recommend, and that's last year's title, The Diamond Swap. It is such a weird hidden role game that again sounded cool but just doesn't really practically work. In it, most of the players work as security but the burglars are there to rob the bank. Their job is to switch out one of the five real diamonds in the middle of the table with one of the fake diamonds that are underneath their bag in front of them. 
At the beginning of the game, security will close their eyes for 10 seconds, and the burglars will switch a diamond in the middle with one that is similar in size but not quite the same. Then, security needs to figure out which diamond chip was switched while the burglars try to lead them astray, and that's the game. In theory, this sounded really cool, but it just honestly didn't work much at all. It's kind of funny as everyone is trying to guess, hey, was this chip this big before? Or wait, wasn't that a tiny piece a moment ago? But it ultimately just fell flat. First off, it works much better on a smaller table as everyone can get a better look at the pieces. And sometimes those differences are very, very slight. At times, it felt almost like you didn't need a person leading others astray because those around the table couldn't tell the difference anyways. Again, this game seemed like a cool idea, but it just didn't work. I invite you to take a look at Oink's website though, because the video on there kind of gives you a good idea of the game. Now I mentioned that the last game was the last original Oink game we would cover, but there are a few notable reworkings I want to mention briefly. The first one is Oink's version of this year's Spiel des Jahres nominee, Scout. They reworked the original minimalist version into a colorful circus-themed version and made it fit into the normal Oink-sized box. I think this is an absolute treat of a card game and one of the better games to come out of Japan in recent years. The other one is Oink's version of Modern Art, a classic auction game by Reiner Knizia. I was a little hesitant to mention it, as you can only get it from Germany and sometimes France, but this game and this version is so good that I would be doing a disservice to Oink by not mentioning it, one of their greatest reworkings to date. But overall, Oink is an interesting publisher to say the least. I get why people collect their games. The boxes are small, colorful, and they almost always have interesting ideas, even if they don't always work. But as much as I like them, they aren't on a level in which I will just blindly buy anything from them anymore. I've parsed down my Oink collection to about 10 out of the 60 they've released, and I'm happy with that. You can find a lot of them online abroad, and I've even seen them in big box stores in the US. If you see a site try to make you buy one for $35, which I saw, that's way too much. They retail for about $20 here. They're supposed to be affordable, and that's another great thing about them. The family friendliness of their games is built into the price point. Just to recap our games, we said to buy A Fake Artist Goes to New York, Insider, Startups, Mask Men, Kobayakawa, and Durian. We said to avoid Deep Sea Adventure, Moneybags, and the Diamond Swap. If you can, the Oink Games versions of Scout and Modern Art are great as well. Thanks for joining us for this brief aside from History and Science. We will be back next week with our usual lessons. Thanks everyone. Sayonara. 